Welcome everyone to another exciting Wu University event. Very excited to have a very special speaker tonight, Dr. Brian Boxer Walker. My name is Dr. Stephanie Wu and I am the founder of Wu University and I am your host for this evening. It's now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Brian Boxer Walkler. Dr. Brian Boxer Walkler is commonly referred to as Dr. Brian by his patients and he is a corneal specialist in Beverly Hills, California. He has a private practice and is also on staff at the Cedar sinai Medical Center. Even though Dr. Brian performs over 12 types of eye, su eye surgery, Dr. Brian's true passion lies in treating keratoconus patients. He has the longest experience in the world performing intacts for keratoconus since 1999 and also non-invasive corneal collagen cross-linking. He also invented the Epion cross-linking called Holcomb C3R in 2003, and he has saved the eyesight of thousands of patients worldwide. Dr. Brian enjoys spending time with his wife and his twin daughters traveling, rowing, and he has over 3 million followers on TikTok, in, on TikTok as a verified influencer. He's also known as the surgeon surgeon because there's so many types of doctors from around the world that will see Dr. Brian to get their own eye surgeries because they trust him so much. And he's also known as one of the most down to earth doctors. And I think this is so important, you know, as, as a patient, you want to feel that your doctor really cares for you, no matter how much money you have, no matter who you are. So whether he's treating a famous celebrity or a manual laborer in the fields, he treats all of his patients the same. Um, Dr. Brian is a very famous eye surgeon, and we are very, very lucky to learn from him this evening. I am so excited to have him as a speaker for RUU. It's a true honor. So take it away, Dr. Brian. Well, thank you so much, Stephanie. Very happy to be here and to help share with everybody that's on about the ICL technology. And I have nothing to disclose. I am uh, not getting paid for this presentation. I'm just doing it because I believe in it. And let's just jump right in. So the ICL stands for the implantable columnar lens. This is what it looks like here. So it's a square lens and the circular area is the optic essentially. And these are the haptics and I'll be showing you how that gets inserted. And this is just another view of it here. It's bowed a little bit because that's uh, how it vaults over the crystalline lens. The lens, once it's implanted, is no maintenance. So it's not like a contact lens. Uh, literally, patients don't have to do anything after it's inserted. It goes behind the iris, and I'll be walking you through that. And at this point, there's been over 1 million lenses performed worldwide. And the history of this lens goes back decades, just like LASIK. So it has a very, very long track record. And we are really seeing the most advanced evolution of this type of lens. It's gone through many evolutions over the decades. And this is the lens, that's the mainstream lens that we use and lots of surgeons use, uh, not only in the United States, but all over the world. One nice thing about the ICL is that it corrects a very large range of myopia and astigmatism because the lens is FDA approved now for astigmatism. And if you can just appreciate how the lens has a certain length, the length is actually customizable to what the internal anatomy is of the patient, because um, we want to have that lens, for example, have a nice vault. And uh, looking at the different lengths is how we can customize it. And the way it works is by focusing just like any other lens, like contacts or glasses, light onto the retina. And the design of it also reduces a lot of internal reflections that can cause some visual side effects. At this point, the lens procedure takes just about 10 minutes or nine minutes to do. It's um, done in a sterile environment. Uh, now we've been doing it for years in the office right here where we do LASIK. And I think a lot of surgeons are moving more towards that. And 
it's a painless procedure because topical numbing drops in a gel is used. So it's just like having LASIK from a patient's experience in terms of going to the office and a one day recovery. Um, some surgeons still do it in an ambulatory surgery center. And that's the way it started originally after it got FDA approved. But like I said, most people are doing it in the office. We've been doing it in the office for um, probably like 15 years. So it's just been a routine part for us here in the office. One thing that uh, the surgeon needs to do is to put uh, iridotomies in the peripheral iris. Uh, this is typically done a week or two ahead of time because it wants, we wanna make sure that there's a egress area for the aqueous fluid coming around the lens to prevent um, like a pupillary block that could increase the pressure in the eye. There's another option to, again, we've always, my, my philosophy has always been, and if some of you know some of the history of things I've done over the years with different procedures is I've always had the mindset, I wanna to try to make whatever the surgery is at the time, the status quo, less invasive to patients, easier recovery, faster recovery. So when I used to do these uh, laser iridotomies, even though you give the uh, numbing drops, you cannot anesthetize the iris. So it's actually really uncomfortable for patients when the laser is hitting the iris tissue to make those openings. Um, so I actually ended up using a technique that we did on the day of the procedure uh, where we make a little surgical iridotomy. So at this point, we don't do the laser. We do this right at the very end of the ICL. So we save the patient having to have essentially like a second procedure. And um, also when you have the laser done because of the pigment coming from the iris uh, to make sure it's pat patent, uh, it makes the vision really blurry for the rest of the day. So we, we save patients that extra day of downtime and having to come to the office for this laser iridotomy. As I mentioned, uh, usually it had been done in uh, surgery centers like this, and we had adopted the same criteria. I actually spent a long time looking at what the ambulatory surgery center criteria were. And we took that same information and we applied the safety criteria to our office-based procedure room. So we converted it into the same level of safety and sterility as an ASC, where cataracts are done, for example. So we don't go to a surgery center. That's why we're able to, again, provide patients with the same safety, but in the comfort and convenience of in the office. And so um, if you will notice though, the surgeons uh, and the assistants are wearing uh, surgical gear in terms of uh, their scrubs and their um, coverings. So we have that same process too. So it almost looks like we're doing cataract surgery when we do it in the office because we have the same um, gowns that we'll do for cataract surgery at the surgery center. Just like with cataract surgery, we'll also between eyes change our, our gowns and our gloves. Uh, a lot of uh, surgeons with LASIK will just kind of go from one eye to the next. So here we're treating each eye as a separate eye for sterility purposes too. So let's talk about how the ICL actually uh, works, what the implantation is like. So keeping in the same theme of the same safe safety and sterility as cataract surgery in a surgery center, we will prep the eye with uh, betadine and drape it in the same way that we do for cataract surgery. So we treat the eye just like because it's an intraocular procedure, even though it's a very minor intraocular procedure, but we will still have that same protocol that we do for prepping the eye for cataract surgery. So then what happens after we expose the eye like this, uh, we will insert a lidocaine and also a viscoelastic, very similar to cataract surgery because we'll want to stabilize the anterior chamber before we insert the lens. So we'll make a little paracentesis at the periphery and um, like in one area here and here, we'll make two paracentesis. And then we'll, after we inflate with viscoelastic, then we will inject the ICL and it comes, again, this could almost look like a cataract surgery uh, insertion. It comes rolled up in a cartridge and it gets inserted and then it will unfold. So it kind of 
unfolds and looks like this. Now at this point, the ICL is in the anterior chamber. So we have an instrument, we go through one of the paracentesis that will push the very corner or haptic of the lens underneath the iris. And we'll do that in all four quadrants here. So now at this point, the lens has been moved into the posterior chamber. So we're tucking it in place. And then one of the key things is that, um, and based on pre-op testing uh, for the anatomy of the eye, for the sizing of the length of the lens is we want to see then a nice vault of the lens. So if here's the cross section of the lens here, and this is the crystalline lens right behind. So that's a nice vault that we'll want to see. And part of the pre-op analysis to help predict what the vault is going to be, because we don't want the lens touching the crystalline lens, but on the other hand, we don't want it pushing the iris too far forward that could, in fact, cause a potential increase in pressure, um, which is very rare. Uh, and I will actually say this, with the FDA study, when the laser iridotomies were done, there was a, um, a certain rate of people who had increased pressure because the one thing about a laser iridotomy that surgeons will usually rely on is looking for a red reflex through the iridotomy openings. But sometimes surgeons can get fooled because you may not have that posterior pigment iris epithelium opened from the laser, but yet you see a red reflex. So it could be giving a little false sense of security that it's patent when in fact it's not, despite having a red reflex. So some cases would have an increased pressure on the day after surgery, and then they have to go back and do an additional laser to open it up further. One advantage that I found in my experience of doing the surgical iridotomy, which is where we make the little opening at the very end of the ICL implantation, we'll put in my call to constrict the pupil, and then I'll just make a surgical opening, is that not, almost always, maybe it's once a year, somebody didn't quite have it patent, but it's super rare to not have it be patent when you do it surgically versus with the laser. So going back to the vault here, uh, preoperatively, there's two ways to assess what the length of the lens is going to be when the surgeon selects the lens. And this is either going to be measuring the white to white from the um, edge of the limbus to limbus, or doing an ultrasound, which is where you can look inside the eye and look at the sulcus, the sulcus to sulcus measurements. And our experience has been, and studies have shown too, that if you have the ability to have an ultrasound, it will give you more accurate sizing to be able to get a more accurate vault uh, when you do the ICL. So um, unfortunately, there's not a lot of great predictability and correlation between the white to white versus the internal sulcus to sulcus. And there have been published studies that have shown that. So like, for example, we use an ultrasound biomicroscopy to get that internal sulcus to sulcus diameter. Here's some examples of various types of vaults that you can see. So this is a normal vault where you'll see, it looks like it's about two cornea thicknesses or so between the posterior edge of the ICL and the anterior crystalline lens here. And if you have a shallow vault, you'll see that space becomes essentially collapsed a bit. So if you consider that diameter here or that distance in here, there's a very sliver of that dark between the back of the ICL and the crystalline lens. Now this is still fine. I would not be exchanging a lens for a longer length to give a bigger vault at this case, but it's just something that uh, we will keep an eye on. Um, and uh, the only time I really would be thinking about exchanging a lens if I had a surprise vault like that would be if the crystalline lens was touching the ICL, uh, particularly in an older patient. Because one thing we do know, we're gonna talk about the rates of uh, cataract formation, which are low, but the older the patient and we have a situation of a lens touch, it does increase the risk if the ICL is not exchanged 
of developing a little anterior, uh, cap, anterior opacity in the crystal lens. But a younger patient can have, um, uh, the lens can have a tremendous reserve for, um, for you know, not developing a cataract. You know, many, many years ago when I was first starting off doing ICLs, I remember there was a person who maybe is like 20 or, or 21, and he was a minus three, he had a little bit of inferior steepening. So I didn't want to do LASIK or PRK for ectasia risk. So we did ICL, but a minus three lens is very floppy and malleable. So when it was coming out, it actually, without me even realizing this, it actually went in and went upside down. But it was, you know, it's a low power lens. I didn't realize that I tucked it in. And um, again, this was really early on in my career. So I don't think I've ever had that happen since. But one day post-op, I'm looking and I'm seeing the lens is actually touching his crystalline lens. Like it's just like pancaked right on there. And I'm like, that's really unusual. So we dilated him and I realized, whoa, holy cow, the lens is actually upside down. So we took him back to the room. We took out the lens and just flipped it and put it back in and he never developed a cataract. Um, so it just kind of is a little bit of a testament that younger uh, patients have a lot more resilience in their crystalline lens than older people. So now let's talk about the other situation where perhaps the lens is vaulting more than you expect. So over here where it's a high vault, it's showing this very large distance between the back of the ICL and the crystalline lens. Again, I, I don't get excited about wanting to exchange this, even if it looks like the anterior chamber is a bit crowded. Um, as long as the pressure is normal and as long as there's no visual aberrations, then I will just observe this. Um, the only time I would exchange it is if actually the pressure was going up and the PI was patent. So uh, even though it's not your ideal looking when you look at the slit lamp, uh, fortunately it's not common, but it can be something that people do fine with and don't have to have it exchanged. Um, I mean, the advantage of the ICL of course is that it is exchangeable, but um, if we don't have to do it, um, then it's not indicated to do it, then we don't wanna do it if it's not indicated. So this is kind of the ideal vault about uh, a thousand mi uh, microns, which is essentially, let's say, uh, you know, two co cornea thicknesses or just under two cornea thicknesses, assuming the average is 500. And um, the way you measure it is just visually. So you'll just measure it at the slit lamp. It's, it's kind of a guesstimate. It doesn't have to be you know, like perfectly 100%, you'll get a sense after a while. But, you know, as I was just showing you with these previous um, images, like right now, you can already get a sense that this is probably about, you know, maybe two cornea thicknesses or one and a half. This one is a sliver. I'd probably call this one maybe like a quarter of a vault. And this one's probably like maybe, you know, two and a half, maybe even three. So, that's the way you'll estimate it. And you'll do it just like use a slit lamp at the angle. You don't have to, again, get too uh, hung up on, is it 30 degrees or 45 degrees when my slit beam is coming through? You know, just do what you're used to doing. Um, you'll use bright illumination, of course, and the slit. It does need to be the slit to be able to get that nice clean image there. And um, let's see. So I'm gonna show you a video of the ICL procedure. So here's the paracentesis. And then there's a second paracentesis. And the pupil will be really nicely dilated. Now this is where the viscoelastic is being inserted. Again, at this point, it looks almost like a cataract procedure. And then a blade will be used to enter. Usually it's a less than three millimeters, two and a half, and the ICL is being inserted and it just automatically unfolds. It's kind of coming out like a taco and then untacos. And typically those leading haptics are gonna be above the iris and then it just unfolds. And it's not actually contacting the crystalline lens when it unfolds because 
you can't see three dimensionally here, but there's a big space of the viscoelastic. Here's the tucking procedure. And by the way, this was not my surgery. This is from Dr. James Lewis. So this is the tucking of those haptics underneath the iris there. And because of the lidocaine that was inserted at the time, at the early start of the case, this is all pretty painless at this point. And this is irrigation aspiration, removing the viscoelastic. And then at the end of the case, uh, pilocarpine, if the laser PI was done, doesn't have to, then the case is done. This looks like two laser PIs were done. You can see a little red reflex there at the bottom. Let me just back that up here just to show you. It showed a little red reflex. Right about there. So there's a little red reflex. So it looks like this patient had two laser PIs uh, beforehand. Uh, the way I do it or when surgeons are doing the surgical PI on the same day, we'll bring the pupil down just like you're seeing, and then we'll make the surgical PI right in the periphery. So we make a little tiny incision, pick it up with a little forceps, make a little snip, and then use a syringe with air and vacuum up the um, posterior pigment epithelium. So it's a still a really tiny PI, but it's called a vacuum uh, iridectomy or iridotomy at that point. And yep, yeah, so that's, that's essentially how it's done, about nine or 10 minutes to do. So there's always a question in people's minds, well, how do I think about this or recommend this compared to LASIK? Especially if you haven't uh, worked with the ICL before and you're listening, you're probably thinking, well, I know how to recommend LASIK. How do I make this decision for a patient and how do I counsel a patient even? So I would say this, when you're having somebody who has a higher level of myopia, um, you have to start thinking about ectasia risk because we know from algorithms that we have an increased risk of ectasia if we start to remove too much tissue with LASIK. And, um, you know, as somebody who specializes in keratoconus, uh, I see tons of people over the years who have had uh, ectasia develop after LASIK, um, even with uh, normal preoperative corneas uh, as well. So I'm really a bit sensitized to this uh, because of uh, what I've seen and treated. And so I would say when we have somebody that has, for example, a high lo higher level of myopia, I have no hesitation at all to be really clear to make the recommendation and discuss it, why with the patient, that I would recommend the ICL over LASIK because if they have thin corneas and they have moderate to higher myopia, um, or they have even a little, any little dash of inferior steepening, if they have a little dash of it, I would still not want to do LASIK for that um, if it's a higher level of myopia. Um, so of course, PRK in lower levels with a little bit of inferior steepening, depending, but I'm still usually going to recommend an ICL just in case uh, as well. So one advantage of the ICL, and this is why I really like this uh, lens so much, is the quality of the vision is really impressive. And I explain to patients, it's like going from your regular TV to like HD TV. And if you can remember making that transition, it was pretty marked. Like I, you were probably like, oh my gosh, I didn't realize like the TV could be so clear. And that's what ICLs give with that quality of vision. So I think part of the reason is, is the, you've got a, um, the difference in, you know, the, uh, the ICL position to the back, the nodal, the nodal plane and the nodal distance. So the ICL, because it's internal, it's closer to the retina than glasses or contact lenses. Uh, and LASIK, of course, for that matter, too, at uh, the cornea plane. So I think you've got that, um, the nodal point distance really helping to improve that quality of vision. And of course, you know that if you have somebody who's a moderate to higher myopia, if they're in glass, as they go to contacts, they're like, oh my gosh, I see so much better in contacts, even though it's still correcting their myopia, right? But you don't have the internal distortions 
of a thicker lens. So take a smaller mini ICL and you have even less distortions than a contact lens and less distortions uh, certainly than LASIK, uh, especially as you get into moderate and higher myopia, like over minus six diopters and up. And that's why that quality of vision is uh, so good in contrast sensitivity as well. And when I say quality of vision, I'm referring to what is measured as contrast sensitivity in the studies that really do back that up. And patients love it. And that's why I love this lens so much because patients are so happy. These will be literally some of your happiest patients that you'll have. So I was so comfortable with this lens that I was asked a patient of mine, uh, Alan Abrahamson, uh, years ago, actually, this was 2000, this was like uh, 13 years ago. I can't believe it's gone by so fast. So he was a, uh, he's a sports journalist and he had very thick glasses and he came in and talked about the ICL and he also worked for NBC, which is uh, own, owns the Today Show. He says, would you like to do this live on TV? And I said, I mean, I've done other surgeries on TV and stuff before. So I'm like, okay, sure. And because I've really been comfortable with the ICL and doing it in our office, I was comfortable doing their office. So ended up doing the procedure um, there on, on the, the show. And um, because it was live, there were some really funny things that also happened behind the scenes. And this is just one uh, screenshot when I had an itchy nose as we were getting ready to do this. And by the way, I mean, if you want to really see something interesting, does anybody recognize what that is in front of me? Anyone recognize that? That's, that's the LADAR vision laser, the eczema laser for LASIK. And it's got that giant like post. So I was even doing the ICLs back in the early days underneath the LADAR vision laser. And uh, it was totally comfortable having this giant post and just worked around it. So um, a little bit of a fun history for some of you who might remember the LADAR vision. Um, so in any case, so I had an itchy nose and I asked my assistant to, because I obviously am scrubbed in, so I can't rub my nose. So she was rubbing my nose. We made a fun documentary. If anybody's interested, it's um, on our website, on our ICL page. So you can find this little fun documentary that was actually shown in a film festival, actually. this behind the scenes of that one whole shoot. So that was kind of fun. And this is a procedure where, you know, many people, high level people um, are comfortable having it too. So there's another example of uh, somebody who, uh, you know, really trusted the technology, uh, Apple D app of the black eyed peas, who was a high myope and had nystagmus as well. And uh, everybody had told him, you know, there's nothing you can do. And while of course the ICL doesn't treat the nystagmus, but it does um, help when he's wearing glasses, not have those distortions from the nystagmus through the glasses. So uh, we did the eye sale with him and, um, you know, it was pretty life-changing for him. And I'd say probably the most um, special experience I've had with the patient was my patient, Stephen Holcomb. And he had keratoconus and I treated him with our Holcomb C3R cross-linking. And then we came, he came back later to have the ICL because he was very, very nearsighted and his contacts were not really even able to correct his high level of nearsightedness. So um, he was the US bobsled driver and his story is pretty amazing. If you're not familiar with it, he had retired from the sport because um, his vision as the driver was declining and he held the secret from all of his teammates that he was losing his vision from keratoconus and he's the driver. So he was learning how to drive by feel. And it got to the point where he felt like, you know, if something happens or I crash the sled because, you know, some people have died bobsledding. Um, he didn't want to have that guilt of injuring his teammates, you know, his pushers. So he had retired and um, fell into a depression and actually tried to commit suicide because of his vision and losing his career. Uh, he luckily survived and uh, they found me. So that's when we did our treatments. And then he came back out of retirement with his vision restored. And it was interesting because he tells the story that when he first got back in the sled, literally after having um, 20, 20 vision, after everything was said and done, uh, he was seeing so much 
going down the sled, like little chips of ice flying off, which he'd never seen before because everything was really blurry. He was driving by feel. He was freaked out and he, he was really funny. He's like, I wouldn't even be doing this if I would known it was like this, if I could have seen from the beginning. So in any case, um, his visor started to get, but, but the thing is you think, okay, now he's gonna like nail it because he's got such good vision, but it was so much visual information driving down the track he just like became actually even worse driving despite having his vision improved. So one day his visor became very dusty sitting in the corner and he put it on and forgot to wipe it off. And then he like nailed the run and had an amazing run. So he scratched up his visor. So at the 2010 Olympics in Vancouver, uh, he'd been racing that whole season uh, with a scratched up visor. And so they won the world championship the year before, which was the first for the United States in 50 years, winning in bobsled. And then they won the gold medal at the Olympics in Vancouver, which was the first for the US in 62 years. So um, for me personally, very um, uh, emotional uh, moment. We were there uh, in Vancouver and I named the procedure after him. So that's why it's called Holcomb C3R uh, in his honor. So the ICL is also trusted not just by athletes and by uh, celebrities, but also by the U.S. military. So the U.S. military has really selected the ICL because they have their uh, troops having <clears throat> the very best vision in the harshest conditions. And so a lot of studies were actually done in the military by Dr. Stephen Schauhorn as well. And uh, that helped lead to it being FDA approved. Uh, and 98% of patients had 20, 20 or better vision. And that's a huge range. That's gonna exceed what LASIK can do for that huge range as well. And 100% felt they were able to see better after having the ICL than even with their contacts and glasses. So I think that really speaks to how we were talking about when you go from glasses to contacts, you have a better quality of vision because the lens is smaller, less distortions or closer to the nodal point, then you go even closer with an ICL. So I think that's why we see that the military saw that with their studies um, as well. So let's talk about now the toric ICL because now that's been FDA approved for a while. So the lens can correct up to four diopters of astigmatism as uh, in addition to the, the spherical component of the myopia. This is just the overview. So in terms of safety, um, it's very rare for someone to lose vision, best corrected vision with the ICL. In fact, most people gain vision. So here over almost 60% of people gained one line and about 16% gained two lines. And um, you, know, you just don't see that with LASIK for those high levels of myopia. You, more likely you're gonna have no change or even a loss of a line of BCVA when you treat the higher myopia. And in terms of stability of the lens, because when you implant an ICL lens, it has to be in a certain orientation. And so an important question is, well, how stable is that lens? Is it gonna rotate and then the astigmatism will be off? And the lens is actually really stable. So here it shows the percentage of people having less than five degrees of rotation, which is you know, between 95, 97% and less than 10 degrees, even higher. So the lens is really quite stable. I would say in my experience uh, of all the patients I've treated, I only had one patient where the lens rotated and I had to um, exchange it for a longer lens. So it can happen, but incredibly rare. And that's even with us using our um, ultrasound biomicroscopy to get the sulcus to sulcus measurement, which is even more accurate than a white to white. So, um, but rare, uh, generally quite stable. And in terms of the effectiveness, you know, here we've got, you know, 90% of people seeing 2020 or better and over 50%, 60% of people seeing 2016 or better as well. And even a quarter, 25% seeing 2012.5. And that's almost like those people can fly the jets in the military at that point. Now this is a really important slide because it really gets to the accuracy of the lens. And as somebody who's done LASIK for now, 
um, over 22 or 23 years, um, I can tell you when we look at the higher degrees of myopia back in the day when we used to treat before we had the ICL, the scatter plot of attempted versus achieved accuracy would really start to widen out because when you're doing LASIK for higher levels of, levels of myopia, you have much more variability of corneal wound healing essentially. So much more variance in overcorrections and undercorrections when you have LASIK. But here, very like impressively, the scatter line doesn't widen out. It doesn't fan out like a peacock's feather as you get into those higher levels of myopia. So um, again, because the lens is inert, you're just inserting the lens. You don't have that, uh, that cornea healing variability. Uh, here's just another way to look at stability too. Uh, the stability of the spherical equivalent over time, which is really virtually identical. Um, one week post-op, really the prescription is not going to change after that at that stage. So incredible level of stability. And again, with LASIK into the higher levels of myopia, you know, you know you're going to see more regression with the higher myopes, and you don't see that with the ICL. Okay, this is another way of looking at another uh, parameter, which is the astigmatism. Again, very stable over time. That one week astigmatism really doesn't change. And uh, somebody, I still do LASIK for high levels of astigmatism. If people aren't candidates for ICL, we do LASIK because they're not candidates. Um, and we'll see regression of high astigmatism. And it's not uncommon to have to do a retreatment or enhancement with LASIK, but not with an ICL. So I would say the benefits of the ICL for people who are not candidates for LASIK um, and have dry eyes and thin corneas, um, those are great candidates um, because you don't wanna have somebody who has dry eyes have LASIK because that will increase their dryness from the cornea nerve disruption from the flap and then from the ablation. And we know that a higher level of ablation for more myopia causes more trauma to the nerves because the ablation is going deeper. We don't have that issue with an ICL at all. And of course, the thin corneas with the ectasia risk. Uh, for people who have keratoconus, after we've treated them with Intax, Holcomb C3R, sometimes we even use conductive keratoplasty for higher astigmatisms and they are in a range of reasonable BCVA, uh, we can do ICLs then as a part two anytime after three months to help improve their uncorrected vision by reducing that myopia. And a lot of times we'll have to counsel them that they'll still wear and benefit from a contact lens or glasses, depending on the stage of um, keratoconus. So we do need to look at the stage when we are giving our tailored expectations but it can really be life-changing for people. I mean, Stephen Holcomb was one example um, that we already talked about. Um, the toric lens um, corrects up to four adapters of astigmatism. We've had some keratoconus patients who were um, having higher levels and we would just explain, you're gonna have some residual astigmatism um, that will be corrected with the lens or somebody who had really high compound myopia and astigmatism and say, you know, we're going to get your prescription down. And then at that point, they could be in the range for like a touch up LASIK for the rest of the astigmatism. But one thing I'll try to do as well is I'll get some astigmatism improvement just by operating and making the incision you saw in the video, the entry incision on the axis of astigmatism. It's a technique I do for cataract surgery too, when people have low degrees of astigmatism, but just that incision in the axis of the astigmatism can get some improvement just by doing it that way as well. You can get even a half a diopter, sometimes even a diopter if I make my incision even longer. So some of that architecture can really help us give even more correction of the astigmatism than the lens can. 99% patient satisfaction rate. And one nice thing that you may not think about, but the lens does have UVA and UVB protection but we still recommend that everyone wear sunglasses outside to protect the rest of their eyes. And it's very biocompatible. One thing I can really tell you, I've never seen anybody have any kind of allergic reaction to the lens 
it's totally inert. I've never seen any issue with the lens. It's made of a, a colomer uh, material and a collagen and a polymer. So it's called colomer. Uh, it's a great material. Also used for cataract lenses as well. And if somebody's got a bigger pupil, side by side for the same prescription, uh, LASIK will have a higher halo risk than the ICL, again, because of the optics there. You have a smaller functional optical zone with higher levels of myopia from LASIK on the cornea, whereas the ICL, the optical zone is gonna be functionally larger. So for people with large pupils, uh, like more than seven, diop seven uh, millimeters or even bigger, I'll say, you know, you may have a little halo around lights at night, um, that's just, you're seeing the edge of the ICL. And even in people with large pupils, when I've counseled them, uh, most people get used to it. They neuro adapt to it. Haven't had a problem. There's only one patient ever in my career where I had to take out the lens because of a big pupil. So, um, almost everybody at neuro adapts to it. Um, of course the lens is removable. It's reversible and it's invisible. So nobody can see it conversationally. Um, even an eye doctor, you can't see it unless you look at them with the slit lamp. Another advantage, of course, we talked about, it does not remove uh, tissue and it's a one day recovery, just like LASIK. And we treat one eye after the other, just like LASIK. So the experience is just like a LASIK experience. So the ideal patient, uh, 21 to 25, 20 to 21 to 45, that's what it is FDA approved for. So of course we will use it selectively over the age of 45, it's off label at that point. So we just have a different consent form. And um, you know, it can correct uh, this wide range like we've talked about and it's uh, very stable, very, very stable. So preoperatively manifest refraction is needed, a very accurate manifest refraction, BCVA, making sure there's nothing going on in the slit lamp. Uh, we also use a contact lens over refraction. That's a second way that we will calculate the lens power to be used. So we use the manifest refraction and a contact lens over refraction. And then between those two, I'll see where the agreement is um, and select the lens power. And also of course, pressure, dilated fundus exam. At the one day post-op, you wanna check for vision and then particularly the pressure. Uh, just in case there was maybe a little pressure increase, um, but the pressure is key at the one day. And then at one week, it's vision, refraction, topography, IOP. And the medications are going to be antibiotic, anti-inflammatory, Diamox, uh, just to blunt any potential pressure. And again, at the one day, another thing to look for is putting fluorescein in, just like after cataract surgery, just to confirm that there's no wound leak. It's extremely rare to have a wound leak. Um, but uh, you still need to confirm for that um, as well. Now in the first week, if somebody does report, and I will explain to patients, I'll say in this first week, this is sort of like my spiel, I'll say in the first week, if you notice the eye gets really red, really painful, and the vision gets really blurry or cloudy, I want you to call immediately before your one week appointment. It could be a sign of a serious infection. Knock on wood, I've never seen an infection in my own hands with the ICL, um, but just in case, I need to let you know. And um, so in terms of keratoconus patients um, that are still gonna need contacts afterwards, uh, after two weeks, they can start getting refit for every type of contact lens at that point. Again, because as we talked about, the prescription is gonna be really stable. And you want to wait the two weeks just to let the cornea incisions have enough time to heal uh, so you don't put any uh, undue stress on the incisions. Contraindications. So who's not a candidate for the ICL? Uncontrolled glaucoma. And honestly, I would even say even anybody with glaucoma, even if it's controlled, to me, that's a no-go for the ICL. Uh, inflammation like iritis diabetic retinopathy, uh, if somebody's pregnant, potentially unstable refraction, uncontrolled collagen vascular disease, blepharitis needs to be treated, sickle cell, uh, somebody had a cataract, obviously cataract surgery is gonna be indicated, not an ICL at that point. Um, what are the risks of the procedure? Well, overall, they're really low. 
Uh, very rare to have somebody lose BCVA. Um, I, even though it's listed, I've never seen anybody with irregular cornea healing. I've never seen epithelial ingrowth. If somebody had just one eye treated and then the other eye wasn't, they could have anismotropia. Um, larger pupils do need to be counseled. They could have a little glare halos at night. Potentially a cataract, um, which I'm gonna talk about in just a moment. Uh, endothelial cell loss, ptosis. Anytime you put a speculum in or anytime anybody's on a steroid eye drop, there's a small chance of a ptosis, which usually is reversible. So these are the results of the um, formation of cataract, which is rare. It's uh, just under 2%. And now this was also in the FDA study. Um, so there was a learning curve also with this group of surgeons. And um, so I think that may be you know, part of it. I, I think it's honestly even lower than that. In my practice, it's very rare uh, to see that happen. Uh, initially, with any sort of intraocular procedure, there's always a little bit of the flushing around of fluids, a little bit of uh, endothelial cell change, but not significant. I can just tell you, over 15 years of doing ICLs, I've never had anybody have cornea decompensation or anything like that. Um, small percentage of people have high pressure, so the PI was not fully patent, had to get revised as well. So very safe. So. Uh, the importance of your role in managing ICLs is providing options uh, in good faith other than LASIK because remember, we're all in it to provide the best for our patients and to, uh, we're trusted resources, which, you know, I think offering the ICL, if that's something that you're comfortable with uh, and believe in as an option, um, to provide that information to the patients. Um, I've just, again, seen too many people where they were kind of not given the option. They had LASIK. In my opinion, they shouldn't have been just stuck with like permanent glare and halos at night because they were a moderate to high myope with big pupils, or then they got dry eyes or they developed keratoconus. So um, that's why I'm just you know really comfortable and really like this lens because it just bypasses that whole road of potential issues. And I, I do LASIK too. So, I mean, this is not something I don't do. I do both procedures, but I'm just giving you uh, my opinion from my experience. Um, and uh, also discussing realistic expectations for the patient too. And, you know, I think it's an opportunity to be really that one-stop shop trusted resource uh, for your patients and providing the education and at the very least, just providing the information. But I can tell you one thing, um, when uh, doctors give patients both options without really discussing what they recommend. It usually breeds confusion and then people don't get anything done. And you probably already know that as well. So I think giving something as a recommendation with confidence really helps patients in guiding their direction to that right decision versus just say, you know, here's A, here's B, it's up to you. Because, you know, they don't know as much as we do. So if we can't even recommend it, how are they gonna decide? So confusion breeds indecision. So it's my first line treatment for anybody over minus six diopters, highly recommended, trusted by doctors, surgeons, the military, 99% success rate, one day recovery in office procedure, both eyes treated the same time, uh, over a million ICLs performed worldwide. It stood the test of time. And I think that's really clear at this point. It is uh, not one of these like, you know, come and go procedures like, you know, can happen in ophthalmology. Uh, this is here to stay and continuing to grow year over year. So I really thank you very much for the opportunity to give you this information. And hopefully this was helpful and stimulate some conversation and questions. And I think we have some time for some questions, Stephanie. Yes. Well, thank you, Dr. Brian. That was so interesting. I loved all the data. I had no idea about the, the data that Vizian had. That was, that was really interesting. And, and I love the videos that, that you were able to share with us too. Those were great. So thank you so much. We do have so many questions. We will get to as many as we can. So first question, you kind of answered it, but you, maybe we can go through just a little bit more. Um, about using ICL in keratoconus patients. Dr. Long kind of wanted to know your thoughts on that and kind of how you make that decision. 
So typically with keratoconus, we'll want to at a minimum, if it's more mild keratoconus and their BCVA is good, we'll do like Holcomb C3R cross-linking. That's our non-invasive cross-linking, I think, as you know. And then if they're myopic and their BCVA is good, then we can also talk about the ICL to correct their vision or uncorrected vision too. If it's somebody with more keratoconus, we'll want to treat it maybe with adding intacts to improve the cornea shape and BCVA. And then depending what their BCVA is three months later, then ICL could help reduce further myopia and astigmatism. Although I do not like, if somebody's gonna need a scleral lens or RGP, I'll, I'll do a uh, spherical ICL. I won't do a toric because yeah. as you know, then you gotta start getting really fancy with those hard based lenses. So I'll use a spherical if they're still gonna need an RGP or scleral after. Great. Uh, next question from Dr. Chung. Will this ever be available for hyperopes? There is an FDA study. It's been going on for at least 20 years. Um, not FDA approved. So I think they're working on it, but I don't know the status of it. Great. Two people have asked the same question. Um, and it is, how long do patients need to be out of their hard or soft contact lenses prior to ICL? So we recommend if it's soft lenses a week, if it's hard lenses, even longer, like two weeks. So we want that cornea to go back to its normal shape before we do the pre-op testing or before the optometrist does the pre-op testing. Great. Dr. Honda asks, what's the minimum amount of myopia for ICL? Great question. So the lowest lens power is a minus three, but there's a conversion that correlates to about a minus two manifest refraction. So minus two uh, spherical equivalent MR would be the lowest because we'll use a minus three generally for that. Great. Uh, Dr. Tran asks, can a patient with an active lifestyle or place contact sports like martial arts get an ICL? Are there concerns or risks of fit? lens dislocation, cataract formation, things like that? So great question. So if it's a lower myo, if I, let's say I had a patient who's an MMA, MMA fighter or boxer, I'd rather than do PRK. But if it's somebody who's a higher myo, it's still not a great idea to be, you know, getting punched in the face with an ICL like routinely. Um, but I've not uh, seen any issues, but it just would make me a little bit uncomfortable personally. Yep. A uh, great question from Dr. Sakihara, because the haptic is tucked into where the trabecular meshwork is, is there any increase of glaucoma when having this procedure done? As long as the PI is patent, no. Great. Dr. Eager wants to know, with ICL, you observe in a week that the refraction is great and stable, what is the percentage that you observe for this quick healing rate where they have that stable manifest refraction? Uh, almost everybody at a week is not gonna change their MR at that point. Great. Uh, Dr. Brandt wants to know how much astigmatism did Mr. Holcomb have and were you able to fit a spherical ICL for him? Yeah, so luckily he didn't have a lot of astigmatism, so we used a spherical ICL. Mm -hmm. um, and then another question, what is the power difference in a contact lens and an ICL? Um, usually, you know, I'm trying to think of the, uh, I just think of it more in terms of MR. So I'm not sure off the top of my head, um, the MR is always less. So I yeah. think an ICL is going to be even, I mean, a, contact lens are going to be even a little bit less because it's less than glasses. So it's going to be still less than an ICL. Right. Okay, great. And then last question. You're testing my Dr. vertex knowledge. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? I was trying to do the math in my head. That's a <laughs> uh, from Dr. Lop, this is, and I actually have the same question. Do you remove the ICL prior to or at the time of cataract surgery? at the same time. So yeah, there've been some patients, we've been doing it for so long that they just naturally develop a cataract. So like, I'll take the same, right, the same sitting, I'll first take the ICL out and then I'll take the cataract out and put a cataract lens implant. Great. Thanks, Dr. Brian. It's a pleasure. Thanks for having me. Thanks for coming, everybody.